Hello. Hello, everyone, and welcome. Uh, how, how is the semester going so far? It's, it's OK? You think you can handle this? Yes, ramping up? Well, uh, to continue to rump up into the fall semester, let me welcome you to our fall semester lecture series. As uh, you probably know uh, from the posters and uh, uh, the, the plasma screens in the college, we have a great lineup of speakers for this fall semester that are going to be addressing a wide variety of subjects, all very relevant to our disciplines and professions here at the College of Architecture and Planning. And uh, uh, as you know, these are things that not just happen by magic. There's no one that can kind of wave a, a wand and it's, it's done. Uh, this kind of uh, uh, series, events, take a lot of effort. And uh, as we get started, I want to thank uh, uh, our faculty, uh, our department chairs, for uh, the effort of uh, looking uh, out there for uh, ideal uh, speakers, uh, nominating them, uh, selecting them, and uh, making this possible. Uh, also, I want to thank uh, uh, Carol Street, our special event coordinator, who probably has gone under hiding. Uh, she knew I was going to mention her. There she is. Uh, uh, for the great job of putting together our lecture series. Please join me in thanking her for the effort. And uh, now to welcome our first uh, guest this semester, I would like to invite uh, Professor Michael Buraidi to make the honors. Michael? My distinct pleasure to welcome our first guest lecturer to CAP. He is in the person of Mr. John Norris. I want to say a few things about Mr. Norris uh, to whet your appetite for his talk. Uh, Mr. Norris was born in Princeton, New Jersey. Oh, I forgot. <laughs> Mr. Mr. Uh, Norris was born in New, uh, Princeton, New Jersey but spent some of his childhood uh, years here in Mansi, uh, so we can take credit in his um, upbringing. Um, he is a native son by implication. Mr. Norris was elected to the Wisconsin State Assembly in 1975 and then went on to serve in the State Senate. Thereafter, he served as the 37th mayor of Milwaukee from 1988 to 2004, when he stepped down to become president of the Congress for New Urbanism. John is described as a principled leader and, I quote, fiscally conservative socialist. That's open to discussion, I guess. As mayor, he kept his city budgets from growing beyond the rate of inflation, decreased property tax rates, and promoted infill and mixed-use pedestrian-friendly development. If any of you have been to Milwaukee, I suggest you take a stroll along Riverwalk. That was the product of Mr. Uh, Norris's administration in Milwaukee. Uh, John also wants me to mention that he was a medic in the U.S. Army. Uh, this is important because if we have an, a medical emergency here, um, he is <laughs> also capable of helping out. John is the author of The Wealth of Cities, which is a must read for all of us um, in the design profession. He has taught courses in urban policy and urban planning at the University of Chicago, the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, and at Marquette University. John's talk today will focus on his work in promoting new urbanism in the U.S. and beyond. Please join me in enthusiastically welcoming our guest lecturer.
All right, you can all hear me fine. I'm John Norquist, as uh, was just pointed out, and uh, we're going to talk about urban planning and architecture and landscape architecture, all three of which uh, almost uniquely involve state. They're all together. Uh, I w went to school on this campus, uh, not Ball State, but the uh, Burris Lab School. My second and third grade career were here on this campus. So, and it was the best school I ever went to, uh, ever. It was so much fun. I remember Miss Lamb, who's probably dead now, but uh, <laughs> she was really good. She started out the class by, she was like about 50 years old, and uh, she always wore a pink scarf around her, her uh, neck and wore too much perfume. But uh, for the kids, we'd all make fun of that. But the first day of school, she walked around and sang, getting to know you, getting to know all about you, and she would pinch your cheek. I mean, it was just really awesome. <laughs> you can't find that in schools anymore. Okay, let's see if this works. Do we have a, somehow that came up. Okay, and we got a remote. Okay. All right, uh, this just happens to be, I'm going to start talking about urbanism and, and how uh, in the late 19th century and early 20th century, it happened so naturally. There's a lot of reasons for that. Uh, this happens to be downtown Evansville, an old postcard. I couldn't find an old postcard with Muncie on it, but I'm sure there is one. I just couldn't find it. Uh, but the Main Street, which is now mostly uh, ripped up and uh, modern buildings and mostly parking lots. But the elements of the uh, Midwestern Main Street were, uh, were remarkably uniform around the Midwest, uh, what they called the two-rod street, two rods of, from the center lane to the building line with usually 50 feet of pavement and seven foot sidewalks, eight foot sidewalks. Somehow that adds up to two rods in each direction from the center line. Um, and then after World War II, a combination of events happened and it just didn't, no longer happen. And people sort of think like, well, just stuff happens. You know, styles change, just things happen. But it didn't just happen. What happened was the rules changed so that, uh, uh, for example, where the street used to be, you know, if you'd gone to Purdue and had a, a civil engineering course back in the 1920s, you would have learned the two-rod street. You, you need a commercial street. Uh, what do you do? Well, you build a two-rod street with the sidewalks big enough so people can walk along and shop and the lane and a half of traffic in each direction uh, so the trucks can double park and do their deliveries and the, the uh, traffic can still get by. Uh, retail on the first floor, apartments or offices above, it just would have been the natural thing that you would learn as a civil engineer if you were laying out a city. After World War II, the purpose of the street changed. So instead of the traditional three purposes that you had throughout human history in the urban context of movement of people and goods, uh, economics, the marketplace, and the social pl gathering place, those were the three purposes of a street in urban context. It was dumbed down to just one, movement of the vehicles. And that's how you end up with this. This is sprawl. This is Brookfield, west of Milwaukee. Uh, and the street uh, is not a place where you're welcome to walk. In fact, if you walk along it, you'll be thought of perhaps as a criminal suspect rather than a law-abiding citizen. Um, and all of the uses are separated. So the streets are very big and just devoted to moving traffic. And then you have uh, everything in its parking pod, the retail, 
the office, and then it, you can't see it very well, but on the other side of the freeway on the top of the picture, the apartment buildings completely separated from the single family homes. And then the single family homes divided by price so that you have the $900,000 homes in one subdivision and the 500000 in another, and then maybe the 300000 or $180,000 homes in another one. Everything stratified. Now, Leo Creer, I don't know if too many of you know who he is. He's kind of a cranky curmudgeon. He's from Luxembourg. He advises Prince Charles, which right away undermines any credibility that he has in the architecture community. But he's a very good architect as measured by the income he draws. So uh, he doesn't give a shit what the uh, architecture community thinks of him. Uh, he's commented on American sprawl and the anti-urbanism of America. And this drawing is sort of a reflection of that commentary. On the right-hand side are the ingredients of the pizza, of a pizza, the dough, the uh, anchovies or whatever they are, the cheese. Uh, and if you spread those out over your counter, you know, ready to prepare a pizza. Then on the right, on the left-hand side is the pizza properly assembled, baked, very delicious. And then in the city, city, I mean, in the center, he shows you the city with the community brought together. So the civic architecture, the city hall, the libraries, the churches, the temples uh, are in with the rest of the city, the places people live, apartment buildings and so forth. And that's the traditional way cities develop throughout human history. But when you have separate use zoning and then streets devoted totally to moving vehicles, then you get basically the pizza ingredients spread out on your counter. And try that sometime. And if you're making a pizza from scratch, don't bother assembling anything. Don't bake it. Just eat all the ingredients separately and see how you like it. And that's basically what Leo thinks of sprawl. Uh, but we have many examples of properly put together neighborhoods. Downtown Muncie, which I visited, uh, of course, many, many years ago, uh, 50 years ago or more. Uh, but I was there about four or five years ago. And a lot of it is still intact. Uh, this is Wicker Park in Chicago, now a very fashionable neighborhood. Maybe 25 years ago, people thought of it as a neighborhood that might decline or slip away. Um, but this is the main intersection at Milwaukee, Damon, and North Avenue. Any of you that have ever been there in Chicago, it has an L stop that's really cool. Restaurants and bars crowded around it. And on a Thursday night, the streets are packed with pedestrians. And it's also very congested. The streets are all one moving lane in each direction with parking. And uh, you know, eight-foot sidewalks, a standard Midwestern street. And they're, all the streets are horribly congested. By the Federal Highway Administration standard, or AASHTO standard, American Association of Highway Officials, um, it is a failure. It's grade F. North Avenue, Damon, um, Milwaukee Avenue are all failures because of the congestion. But they're not just congested with traffic. They're congested with money and good real estate prices and really high retail sales per square foot. It's crowded because people want to be there. And so if you went to, say, Woodward Avenue in Detroit at Six Mile Road, you would find by the, by the federal policy of the FHWA and by the state DOTs, say the Michigan DOT, it's A. It rates an A because it's not congested. Detroit, by measuring by American transportation policy of wanting to defeat congestion, to conquer congestion, to eliminate congestion, the most successful city in the United States by far is Detroit. And all of the cities that 
you think of as successful, like San Francisco and New York and Chicago, are failures. And the policy is designed to turn all American cities into A, traffic level A, or, or B, or C. Traffic level A means it's free-flowing. That's the goal. That's what spending billions of dollars. That's, that's what's happening right now, even under an environmentally-minded president when they did the stimulus bill. That money, most of that money that was going to Rose was going to reach traffic level A, to try to create a situation where people could drive fast and nothing else matters. Nothing. Toronto is another place like this. This is Dundas Street in Toronto. That's Chinatown. They have one moving lane in each direction, just one, with parking. And the parking is all day, just like in Chicago. Even at rush hour, there's parking. You know why? Because the retail merchants have more political clout than the traffic engineers. And so when the traffic engineers say, no, no, we have to disallow parking at rush hour, and a retail merchant is, is uh, on North Avenue in Chicago, he's writing out a check to the alderman for his campaign. And the alderman says, you know, the traffic engineer made an interesting point, but we're going to leave that parking open. And it works just fine. That's one example. That's why I'm a big defender of the political machine in Chicago. It is rotten to the core, but actually, a lot of good things happen because it's so corrupt. It actually works in its own way. Um, anyway, here, let's go back to a cleaner city, Toronto. <laughs> Toronto. So this street is cro horribly crowded, and, but yet they have a streetcar line on the street, on the same lane, the one lane in each direction that the cars can use. The streetcar's on there, too, and the streetcar's packed. And even though it's a congested street, people still drive on it. That's why it's still congested. Uh, everybody wants to be on the street. I was on Dundas on Sunday morning one time. It was packed. People wanted dim sum. And they, they're lined up going into these restaurants to get the dim sum. It, so, you know, you have to start thinking when they talk about, if any of you that are going to be planners, when somebody says that a street is congested and we have to do something about it, think twice. Because you might be sacrificing a lot. I mean, there's Chinatown in Toronto is worth at least a billion dollars in real estate value. Probably a lot more than that. And you could diminish it very quickly by trying to address the connection problem, I mean, the congestion problem. Now, things are changing for the better. I don't want to sound mocking about America. The, the, it'll surprise you to know that this is Pasadena, California. Remember the little old lady from Pasadena, and it's a driving city, and drag racing on Colorado Boulevard with the Beach Boys and all that sort of thing. But this is, this is Del Mar, uh, the Del Mar station on the Gold Line, and there's... 700 units of housing packed around that station. And Pasadena and Los Angeles, they're all becoming more urban. It's actually, they're adding more transit all the time, both rail and rapid bus. It's becoming a very urban city. Uh, and so things are improving. Once again, America, after do exploring every stupid option, ends up uh, doing the right thing. Uh, Another way to look at planning and traffic is uh, the reasons we do it. We widen streets so that the streets will be safer. That's the idea, so the vehicles won't hit anything. And if you do make the streets wide enough, it's true that pedestrians will absolutely stop even trying to cross the street. If you can, cre if you can create a dangerous enough situation for pedestrians, they'll finally just give up and then they won't get killed. They'll, they'll buy a car or rent a car or hitch a ride. Somehow they'll get across that street. Uh, and another reason we build wide streets is for the fire trucks. Uh, but if you look at, at, um, at why we have pedestrian injuries, 
it's not because the streets are too big. It's if you look at the chart at the top, it's because when the vehicles are moving fast, that's when people die. You can survive a collision between your body and a vehicle at say five miles an hour. You know, if you're in a parking lot, you could die, but you're very unlikely to die. You probably get injured maybe, but you're not going to die. But above 38 miles per hour, if you have a crash with a vehicle, you'll die. It's pretty much 100%. There might be a few exceptions, you know, one in 100,000 chance you live. But you're going to die. And so if you want to have less pedestrian death, don't widen the streets. Uh, just have the streets wide enough so the vehicles can get by and have the traffic moving slower, and you'll have less pedestrian injuries. But the, ironically, it's the fire service that often insists on these really big streets, usually so that two fire trucks could, in the one in a million chance they'd ever have to do that, that they could pass each other. And so you end up with municipal ordinances requiring 10-foot lanes in each direction on residential streets with 8 feet for parking. So that's 16 plus 20, 36 feet for a residential street. It's pretty hard to have a quaint, comfortable, leafy neighborhood with 36 foot wide streets. The trees really aren't going to make it all the way over. And, uh, and it's not safe. Then the kids, you know, the cars go too fast if there's 36 feet of pavement. And if you look at the statistics, um, there are 2,596 fatalities uh, for, uh, in fires and 43,560 traffic fatalities. And then even with firefighters, you know, riding on the vehicles, uh, the firefighters are much more likely to be killed in a uh, vehicle accident than they are in a fire. And so this idea that somehow uh, that it's, and, and the idea that you could get to a fire faster just because the streets are bigger. What happens when you make the streets bigger, you have really big streets, then the, uh, you end up with a lot of cul-de-sacs. You have a really steep hierarchy of roads. So you go very quickly from a cul-de-sac to the big arterial to the freeway. So everything's loaded on the same streets, and you end up with congestion, really uh, serious congestion, and congestion without any of the other benefits of congestion that you get on uh, more urban streets. Uh, now, I'm going to switch back and forth between architecture and planning, just because I, and this school should appreciate that, because they really ought to be taught together anyway. Uh, it's too bad that the professions are so separated. In Europe, they're a little more likely to do them all together. And congratulations to Ball State for doing it right. The only thing you're missing is an engineering school. You should also have that here, seeing as they dominate the uh, building industry anyway. Uh, but you can work on that later. All right. So what I want you to see here is that there's a building going up. Uh, this is in Milwaukee on Water Street downtown. And it's going up on a lot with a 19-foot frontage. And back in the late 60s, the city of Milwaukee decided to uh, put an uh, off-street parking ordinance in place in downtown Milwaukee, requiring, in this case, with a 19-foot frontage and about a 55-foot uh, depth to the building, to the lot, seven off-street parking places with a 19-foot frontage. So for about 30 years, there was an empty lot there because the building had been lost to fire. So for 30 years, there was an empty lot. We simply removed the requirement. And almost instantly, the property owner saw the wisdom of uh, putting up this building. Nice building, fit right in. But the empty tooth on the, on the block had been induced by our regulation. Now, let me tell you how I feel about off-street parking regulations. I am completely libertarian on it. I am against off-street parking regulations. I don't think government should do it. I think it ought to be between the property owner and the tenants. It has nothing to do with the government shouldn't be involved. But if you did want to do something, it shouldn't be a minimum parking requirement. You could be like Portland. 
you know, hippie Portland, whatever you want to, smart growth Portland. You can have a maximum, a parking maximum. That I could go along with. But you don't even have to do that. When I have debates with libertarians like the uh, very unpleasant Randall O'Toole, I don't know if any of you ever heard of him, from the, uh, it used to be with the Reason Foundation, and he became even more unreasonable and went to the Cato Foundation. And uh, the Cato Foundation, which is for free enterprise, but I love debating Randall because he's not really for free enterprise. He's for free enterprise for transit, and he's for Soviet communism for roads. You know, completely sub. If he had his way, the entire economy would be devoted to subsidizing roads. He's just in love with roads. But uh, anyway, I'm against any regulation for parking because if you if there is no regulation, then there then the the uh, property owner can figure it out for themselves. Uh, another thing that happened in the 60s in a lot of cities, almost all the cities in the Midwest, places like Fort Wayne and so forth, is uh, on old streets that weren't wide enough according to the current regulation. You know, the 50-foot street isn't wide enough, so they go for 72, which is, would be about the standard arterial today if you were building a new commercial street. And so they started condemning property, they put a setback line on this street in Milwaukee, National Avenue, so that it could be 72 feet of pavement someday. That meant that a street that's three miles long in the city, all of the property on the southern side of this east-west arterial, all of it, became a non-conforming use. Meaning that if you bought the property, or you were selling the property or buying the property, you'd go through a title search and you'd find out that it was encumbered and you couldn't, uh, you couldn't build on it except for back where the setback line is. So we repealed those things in Milwaukee. And this is an example of a different street that had that regulation. We took it away and there was an empty lot and the property owner built it right up to the street line. Um, another thing that happens is that I'll criticize all over the ideological spectrum. A lot of times, people that care about smart growth and the environment, they pick out a particular villain, in this case, the villainous Walmart. Okay, now, in Milwaukee, we had the first big shopping center was Capitol Court on, on the northwest side of the city. And back in those days, there was a lot of Germans and Poles living in the neighborhood. Uh, and so Capitol Court came in. Later on, it became an African-American neighborhood. It was still a middle-class African-American neighborhood. But the retail uh, rating system uh, tends, it, it still has, it's still blatantly racist. But it was even more blatantly racist back then. Anyway, no retailer would go into this place. Some guy bought it. Uh, an entrepreneur bought this old site and he put the uh, the only anchor tenant he could get was Walmart. And I was the mayor at the time. He came to me and said, how are we going to get this through? The unions don't like Walmart. Uh, you know, I was like, well, let's, uh, we can get it through. We figured we had a strategy. We got the local community. And we did get it through. And not only did Walmart go there, but they built their building up on the sidewalk on a street, Hope Avenue, uh, and there actually, there's now a building, I have to get a new picture, but there's actually a building on that empty lot next to it so that Walmart's actually touching a competitor's building, which normally they don't like to do. Um, and there they are. They're like a department store. And so don't assume that big boxes are automatically bad. You can put a big box like Target or Home Depot. I'll show you Home Depot in just a minute into an urban situation where they function very much like a department store, just like uh, uh, Marshall Fields was in Chicago or Macy's in New York. Here's Home Depot. On Halstead Avenue in Chicago, there's parking in front with meters. Uh, there's uh, no visible parking. There's a lot underneath the building. Uh, there's escalators in it. If you took Home Depot off of the building and put Nordstrom's on it, it would look like a Nordstrom. Uh, so Home Depot is able to build a 
an urban store. Uh, now, getting back to the parking regulations, parking regulations don't just affect cities by making it hard to redevelop old cities like downtown Muncie. Probably, I, I should check that, but downtown Muncie probably has a parking minimum. It doesn't. Congratulate, did they repeal it or they never had one? That's great. That's great. They avoided it. Um, the, the, I'm going to talk about a different parking regulation now, which was a parking ordinance that, according to Donald Shoup, who wrote a great book called The High Cost of Free Parking. He's an economist at UCLA. And uh, he traced the bowling alley parking ordinance to some place in Ohio. He wasn't quite sure if it was Fostoria or Lima, you know, which exactly where it was. But uh, the bowling alley one. Now, somebody, an alderman or somebody, came to the city planner and said, this is his speculation. He didn't actually know this for a fact. But he speculates that they came to a city planner and said, how many minimum parking spots for a bowling alley? And instead of the planner saying, I don't know and who cares, which would have been the appropriate thing to do, he said, five per lane. Five per lane. Now, you only have four people bowl in each lane, but then you maybe have somebody keeping score. So you have enough parking. So the, anyway, this ordinance spread all over the Midwest. And you can see this scene all over the Midwest to, to this day. The empty, giant bolodrome or in this case, Paradise Lanes, surrounded by a weed-strewn parking lot. And that happened not because the market demanded that. It happened because these ordinances spread all over the place. Now, again, you can fix it. You know, America is fixable. You don't have to assume, just get all depressed about it and move to Canada or something like that. You can, this is Cisco's uh, parking lot in Santa Clara County, California, and uh, this is what they're planning, is to line the parking lot with condos and apartment buildings and basically turn it into a city. And hopefully they'll make the block structure a little smaller, uh, and, and it might actually work really well. Another area that is interesting to look at is in terms of regulation, and this one illustrates why these things happen, and I think this would also be true of parking regulations, but you have the Council of Education Facility Planners, and they meet every year, and you can't stand still. You have to make things better. You have to upgrade the profession, and you have to raise the standards so that civilization can advance. And so what they did year after year was raise the standards for schools. You know, they, some of them were really legitimate things, like you know, you should have proper ventilation, you should have uh, you know enough room in the hallways so you can evacuate the building. There's all kinds of legitimate things they could do, but one of them was to have bigger spaces for the schools, more acreage, and so the National Association came up with 30 acres minimum for a high school. Um, 20 acres for a middle school and 10 acres for a, high for a grade school. Now, 10 acres for a grade school is interesting because Wrigley Field is 8.7 acres. So you have to have more land than Wrigley Field in order to have an elementary school to meet their standards. And then the states started adopting it all across the country. Even New York State adopted it, although they had to exempt New York City because there's not enough room to obey by the standard, to obey the standard. But Arkansas, under Bill Clinton, who I like, I, even though I'm about to criticize him, he wanted Arkansas to advance, stop being looked as a place where there was a bunch of stupid hillbillies, but to be an advanced place with education improving all the time. And so they decided instead of 30, 20, and 10, uh, Arkansas upgraded their standard to 35 acres therefore standing above the rest of the country in education. Uh, but it, it really uh, defeats a lot of good things when you do this, because traditionally if you had a high school um, 
with, um, if you had a high school in the middle of a city, then people from the various neighborhoods could walk to school. You put the high school way out in the suburbs on a giant lot, all of a sudden everybody has to drive and you have to have parking for the teachers, you have to have parking for the 11th graders and 12th graders, even the 10th graders that are over 16. Uh, you know, it changes everything. And you can see that in Anderson, Indiana. You know, there was the high school, and they have the new high school with the parking lot. Uh, and the, the, it forces the, uh, you know, it's not a big deal to lose the farmland. Indiana has plenty of farmland. It's, it's not like, that you hear that argument all the time. Oh, we're losing farm. Well, you have a lot of farmland. But the problem is, is that then the kids can't walk to school. And they become obese. And they get health problems. And they drive too much. And they get killed in car accidents. Um, so it's a, it's a bad idea. Another thing schools do is they, they have standards about lawn care. And for those of you that are going to be landscape architects, if you're doing the landscape architecture for a school, it's not just about how it looks. It's whether or not it poisons the children. So here you have a really good playground, from my point of view, because it has dandelions on it. Dandelions are edible. You can you know, put them in a salad or whatever. Um, but a lot of schools, there's hundreds of millions of dollars spent on herbicides to poison the lawn so that the dandelions can't grow. And then the kids play on the ground and put it in their mouth, and it uh, poisons them. You know, so if you're a landscape architect, you have a moral obligation to confront these kinds of things. This particular school is a blocky high school. The custodian, who, uh, uh, and when I was mayor, I gave the guy an award. He stood up to the school administration and refused to put the herbicide to kill the dandelions. And so we gave him an award for doing that. This is the James Audubon Middle School. And this is in honor of James Audubon. You know, well, you get the point. And municipal architecture in the past uh, was something that was often done on the remnant pieces of property that were left. There was a, in Milwaukee in 1893, the city hall was built on one little piece of property that was left, a small, odd-shaped uh, block. But they built the magnificent building. So instead of spending the money on land, they spent the money on the bell tower and the beautiful building. But typically nowadays, municipal architecture is basically garage architecture. This is a suburb of Milwaukee. Uh, you, you, the main purpose of the building is, is storage of trucks. There will be a little room maybe with a little table and some folding chairs where the village board meets. Um, you know, this has reduced your ability to get a job. The fact that architecture has regressed to this point, where municipal architecture doesn't even need an architect anymore. Just take a CAD drawing off a computer. This is uh, Brookfield City Hall, a suburb of Milwaukee. And I went out there and talked to them about design and these issues, and they were they were so impressed that they put a bell tower on their building. But anyway, redeeming, I guess. And the convention center in Milwaukee in 1873, built on one block. It, it burned down in 1903. But, and then they built this thing that looks like a something you'd put a CD in, you know, they have an electronic machine. Um, that didn't work, so we tore that down, and then we built something that, at least it has windows. It's a little bit uh, much otherwise. But, okay, now I want to talk about Gropius, Walter Gropius, the head of the Bauhaus. Some of the coolest stuff you'll ever see, you know, the furniture, the pens, the, the houses, uh, Weimar. And he was against the Nazis, good for him. He was a social democrat. Um, and he, he, w he had an affair with my wife's great aunt, Edie Hartshorn, uh, who was his assistant. So I, I know a little bit about it. I've gone through his papers. Um, 
that they keep at the summer place in, uh, in New Hampshire. Brilliant. And he was horrified by World War I, the first machine war, millions of people killed, the Battle of the Somme, uh, Verdun, hundreds of thousands of people killed in just a matter of a week. Uh, and so the old world, the, the, the world, the royal architecture, the imperial architecture of the idiots that caused World War I was repulsive to him. And so it's under, I'm explaining why he did something that I think is really bad. Uh, he designed the new curriculum for Harvard after fleeing the Nazis. In, I think it was 1937, he became head of the Harvard School of Design. And he started working on a new curriculum, which he had put in place by the end of the war. And it spread all over the country, including to Ball State, I'm sure. Um, and one of the things that he had in the curriculum was not to terminate the vista, lining it up with the center of the street. So this is Port Washington, Wisconsin, 29 miles north of Milwaukee. It was built out in the late 19th century, the St. Mary's Catholic Church, lining up perfectly with the center lane, two rod street with the first floor retail apartments above. Um, and he said, not to do that anymore. Okay, so this was done with a pattern book. They really didn't have a real planner. They just had a pattern book from the Austrian Empire. Um, so they didn't. So at the, after World War II, for the next, until the 1990s, nobody, I haven't been able to find but two examples of where a terminated vista was put in place purposely. And the two examples, I'll show you one of them, is one is in Anaheim and this one is in Orlando because Walt Disney knew that you could terminate the vista and it would create this wonderful room. But if you go by the Harvard curriculum, uh, you're not supposed to do that. And I, nobody quite understands why. Maybe revulsion to World War I. But I think that's something that should be challenged and explored, particularly in academia. Uh, you know, what's wrong with terminated vistas? Here's an uh, Italian hill town, uh, ink drawing. Or the Chicago Board of Trade, built in 1925 to 7. The terminated vista was still allowed then. And it's wonderful today. Sometimes I'll go out of my way in Chicago. Our office is at Adams and Dearborn. I'll go over to LaSalle and just walk down the street. It feels so good to see that terminated vista. Or in Holland in the 17th century, they could create this beautiful thing. And now we can't do it anymore. But it is coming back. It's not coming back because of academia. It's not coming back because of sophisticated architects. It's coming back because of developers. Here's an example. Target. This is at uh, the what was the Washingtonian Mall. It was scraped, and then they put a, quote, lifestyle center in. Um, and the vista is terminated with the R and G right between it, almost lining up perfectly with the center lane. They haven't got it quite right. Maybe next time. These buildings only last 10, 15 years anyway. You can always do it over. Or... Uh, Anyway, uh, so how did this happen? One of the ways it happened was Corbusier, another guy who was re repelled by World War I. I don't think he was quite as morally upset about it as Gropius was, but uh, this is his drawing from 1922 of what the street should be like. And what he does here is he gets rid of those pesky pedestrians. They're out. They're off the street. You don't have them anymore, just the vehicles. You get rid of the social purpose of the street, the retail purpose, uh, and you just have the vehicles. And you can see this all over America. You can see it in the suburbs of Indianapolis, or in this case, Crystal City, right near Reagan Airport in, in uh, D.C. Uh, although now they're going to turn this into a street. This is the Thomas, I mean, the uh, Jefferson Davis the head of the Confederacy, the Jefferson Davis Highway, which will now become Jefferson Davis Boulevard, and we'll have sidewalks. 
Currently, you're not allowed to walk on it, but soon you will be. And there's Corbu. And Corbu is very seductive, just the way he looked and dressed and lived. Uh, you know, if you go to Harvard School of Design, about 20% of the students have glasses exactly like that. I mean, they still love the guy. And this is what he wanted to do to the right bank of the Seine, with all streets grade separated, all the buildings removed, and that's like billions of dollars, euros, dollars, real dollars, of real estate today. That's the Jewish quarter on the right bank saying, wiped out to put in these tall buildings. Fortunately, it didn't happen. Uh, all of the intersections would have been grade separated. Would have, would have been a most uninteresting place to walk. So one of Corbu's disciples, a uh, Japanese, um, blank, starts with an M, anyway, he did Pruitt Ego in St. Louis. And it didn't work. You know, the idea of poor people being all alone in an industrial-looking building on a big, empty lot didn't work. And so after 20 years, they tore down the building. But the, the idea is all over. This the Ban Lu outside of Paris. This is the Picasso housing estates. Um, it's seductive. I mean, the photographs are beautiful. It's the Hadid's dormitories for the 2012 Olympics that didn't happen in New York, but it got her the Pritzker Prize. It's Corbu's idea. Towers in the park, roads uh, for just the vehicles. Uh, it creates the whole scene all over again, and it keeps coming back. It's now coming back in what's called the landscape urbanism, which also comes out of uh, Harvard and also Toronto University, where you basically create towers in wildflowers. Instead of tower in the park, you, instead of the grass or the ugly parking lot with a dumpster, you have wildflowers. And that's, that makes the, the, the tower look sophisticated again. And it's the cutting edge of design thought. And that's what we're getting out of Harvard today. Um, or the, you know, this, I'm not even going to go there. Um, OK, the, the other great modernist and a great designer, and if you ever go to Paris, go to the French Communist Party headquarters. It's beautiful. I don't have a slide of it up here today. But the, Oscar Niemeyer, great architect. If you, want, you know, the French Communist Party headquarters in, a, in the 19th, 18th century city, uh, this modernist building surrounded by old Paris, Gorgeous, stunning. Anyway, but he, like Corbu, he, when it came to planning, that's where you can start to have problems with him. Brasilia. Anybody here ever been to Brasilia? You've been there? Oh, yeah. Well, anyway, he did a, a grade separated city, just what Corbu was talking about doing on the right bank of the Seine. He went ahead and did it. That's the Congress on the other side of that mall. All the, city, all the big streets, which are most of the streets, are big arterial streets. The blocks are so huge, that's about all they have, are like this. It's, it's a pedestrian hell until you get to the slums. When you get to the slums outside of Brasilia, that's where the great restaurants are, the, the Bossa Nova, you know, whatever you want. But in the city itself, it's absolute pedestrian hell. Nobody goes to Brasilia on vacation. You go to Rio, not to Brasilia. Now, getting back to the U.S., here's that two-rod street again. This is Kinney Connect Avenue in Milwaukee. You can see the la lane, one lane in each direction, but enough room to double park, so it works beautifully for loading up stores with merchandise. Um, Eight-foot sidewalks, retail on the first floor, and look at all the variety on the blocks. You have hardware store, insurance agency, coffee shop, um, a women's clothing store, a liquor store, a bar, another bar. After you go to the liquor store and the bar, you can go down the street and confess at a Catholic church, all in the same streetscape. In suburbia today, there aren't any churches built on blocks with any other buildings. They're all on their own block. God believes in separate use zoning, apparently. So you have a parking lot with an industrial-looking building with a cross on top. And that's, all, that's what church architecture has declined into. You look at, you know, maybe it's because uh, architects aren't religious enough to take 
art, church architecture seriously. I don't know. But a lot of it has to do with coding and zoning. You, it's fabulous to have multiple types of buildings along a street and to allow housing in the same proximity with retail. It creates value. And in this recession, it's those places that haven't been hammered. The separate use zoning sprawled out suburbs, they're getting, hit, they're getting killed. Places like Yorkville, Illinois, which is 28 miles west of Chicago, southwest of Chicago, is not working. The real estate prices collapsed. The retail shops are devastated. This is the 72-foot arterial that they teach them in engineering, traffic engineering school now. 72 feet of pavement, 20-foot uh, median, so you can do a double left-turn pork chop lane at the intersection, uh, and no money left over for sidewalks, so you end up uh, walking in the dirt, or as an alternative, you can walk in the gutter. And this is what I mean by pedestrian is criminal suspect. That's what pedestrians are. In most of America, you are a criminal suspect if you walk along the street. Now, if you're a real American, a real God-fearing, flag-waving American, you're going to be in that truck. <laughs> and then the cops will leave you alone. Now, Americans have a love affair with the automobile. Here's your choice. Here's the free choice. You can be in a vehicle and be respected, or you can go to jail. That's why Americans choose not to walk. That's why they choose not to. And sidewalks. What's wrong with sidewalks? Well, they're wonderful places. Look how beautiful it is. And, it, and it's used for transportation. You know, kids use it for uh, scooters. And the, you can play on streets, I mean, on sidewalks. And the Commonwealth Avenue in Boston is beautiful. But this is what we spend all the money on. You, and it only has one, this is over half of the money that's spent on pavement in America goes to these grade separated roads. And it only has one purpose, just moving vehicles. I mean, sure, you can pull off on the side if you're distressed. You could maybe argue that the conversation you have with a state trooper is social. Like, don't give me a ticket. The guy in front of me was going faster than I was. But, you know, this is it. And is it that important to go fast? And then at rush hour, they don't work anyway. These kind of roads, uh, in, in, particularly in a big city, uh, congest. The Potomac Freeway in Washington, D.C., at peak half hours, three to six miles per hour. Connecticut Avenue, which is just a street. It's a big street, but it's connected to the street grid. Eight to 13 miles per hour at the same time. So when you need it the most, the street works best. In the middle of the morning, two in the morning, sure, the freeway works better. But it, it's, an, it's a non urban form. And it has no value other than having all these vehicles clogged up. And the car industry knows that, so that's why they, when they're selling cars, they don't show the freeway, they show the forest or the city. They have to usually go to Europe. So this is Prague. And that's the Charles Bridge in the background, which doesn't meet Federal Highway Administration standards. In fact, none of the bridges in Prague meet Federal Highway Administration standards. Um, so just imagine what the Indiana DOT could do to Prague. You know, I mean, they must have congestion that needs to be defeated. They could, uh, it's the most successful of the former Warsaw Pact cities. It's the richest. A lot of them, American corporations have their uh, European headquarters there, like Harley Davidson and Johnson Controls and lots of others. We could change that. Uh, now, this is New Orleans. This is uh, Claiborne Avenue uh, in 1947. Uh, Louis Armstrong lived there. It was the black, upper middle class, Creole, African American street. And uh, it had a median, a huge what they call a common ground, or neutral ground, neutral ground. And uh, in 1966, they started tearing it apart so that the, they could solve the traffic congestion problem. And so they did. And, uh, you know, this isn't in Cuba. This is in New Orleans in 1966. But uh, the old cars are 
kind of cool. Um, so that they improved it, you know, but all the most of the businesses closed. The neighborhood lost its value. Lee Armstrong moved away, um, and uh, that's the way it looked. Now, that's this intersection right here, uh, which was a circle like the like the veteran circle in Indianapolis, which is actually very beautiful. I love that. When I was a little kid, I even liked it then. Um, but they put a freeway on top of it. What we're doing in CNU is working with a local group called the Treme Association, which Winton Marsalis's father is a member of. So it's, I always like going down there. I usually get some sort of jazz concert in somebody's backyard when I'm done. It's like the TV show Treme. But um, anyway, this is what we want to do is put it back. Now, let's move to a different city, Detroit. And this is Woodward Avenue at the end of World War II. Uh, and they had three department stores, Kearns, Crowley's, and Hudson's, the second biggest department store in America. And they had streetcars, packed sidewalks. Detroit was the most successful productive city in the world during World War II, supplying tanks, howitzers, guns, ammunition, you name it, um, to not just us, but the British and the Russians. The Russian army used a lot of stuff built in Detroit. And they won the war. And so it was the most successful city in the world in World War II. And then they started worrying about congestion. So they removed a lot of the city to build the freeways. And 30 years later, Hudson's came down. And uh, this is Berlin in May of 1945. They lost. They lost World War II. This was right after the Red Army was done exacting their revenge, which they certainly deserved have exacted. Um, and about 70% of the buildings were destroyed. Now, this is Potsdamer Platz, uh, which wasn't fixed right after the war because, well, it was to some extent, but then when the wall was built, it was built right here. So this was all built since 1989. It has the biggest railroad station in Europe there, and it's just packed with development. They even won an award from ULI. Um, but anyway, it's all back. This is Warsaw at the end of the war. The Germans, uh, Hitler uh, said every building should be pulled down, every brick torn apart. They did, except for a few buildings like the Bristol Hotel where the German general staff was staying. They, they left that. But um, Warsaw is all built back. And some people say it's not a lovely city, but I was there, I've been there twice. I was there last December, and it's a remarkably beautiful city. Uh, well planned, well laid out. It has some of the Plattenbau socialist apartment buildings that don't look so good. But it's, it uh, was devastating in World War II, and it's back. This is Detroit about five years ago, an aerial shot. Some of those buildings are gone now. About 35% of the buildings that were building sites that had buildings on them at the end of World War II are now empty. We won World War II, and it looks like we lost it. If you look at Detroit, you'd think that was the epicenter of World War II. And, you know, you can say, well, yeah, but the auto industry, what do you expect? The auto industry declined. Okay, Torino used to be the big manufacturing center for Fiat. They still have the corporate headquarters, but they don't make cars in Torino. Torino is beautiful. Uh, you know, there's auto cities all over the world that are beautiful. Just because you have auto manufacturing doesn't mean the city has to be but ugly. And Detroit was beautiful at the end of World War II, as you saw. But now that's what it looks like. Now you can come up with reasons, you know, social reasons, you know, the social policy, all kinds of things. But I can tell you, one of the biggest reasons is that they made it really easy for everything to go away. Big, big roads ripped out. They had 350 miles of streetcar in Detroit, all gone by 1956. Uh, so, but and the policy was aimed at eliminating congestion, and it did. Congestion is not a problem for Detroit anymore. That's the way it looks at ground level. You have pheasant. Uh, 
than here in Milwaukee, we had an active anti-freeway movement in Milwaukee. So about half of the freeways never got built. But this was uh, the African-American community, like the Treme, like Claiborne in New Orleans, Walnut Street. And this is how it looked after the Wisconsin Highway Department improved it. It was so important to be able to move those vehicles faster that they eliminated the neighborhood. But the people in the neighborhood still meet. They still have a picnic every July. And the old timers come and talk about the old neighborhood. They don't forget. And you know, when you build these things, it creates noise and dirt. And people complain about it. And the politicians, like when I was in the state legislature, what are you going to do about it? It's so noisy next to the road. Well, OK, we'll give you a sound barrier. And the sound barriers that work the best are steel reinforced concrete. They work better than the wood. The wood looks better, but the steel reinforced corrugated concrete. So this really, it's the only surviving technology of the old East German Republic. You can see the prototype here. <laughs> so that if, you know, if Eric, if Eric Honecker came back to life in Berlin, he'd be totally disoriented. The wall's gone. But he could go to San Antonio, Texas. This is the Martin Luther King Drive. This is how we honor Dr. King with this, uh, this wall. Um, now, the freeways, the, things are changing. They only last about 40, 45, 50 years, and uh, the elevated ones in particular. And so this is the West Side Highway in New York, uh, pictured during World War II. In 1973, it fell down, about 40 years after it was built. Uh, and now it was replaced by West Street. There's no freeway. They just put the avenue along there. It opened up the view. There's nothing special about the avenue either. It's just, it's not particularly beautiful. But it opened up the views, and it connected the street to the grid. So travelers have lots of options. And people that were going from one part of New Jersey to another part of New Jersey no longer were using the road. So uh, they didn't have as much traffic. But it's worked really well. Then you go to San Francisco. The earthquake hit in 89. Uh, the Embarcadero was damaged. They put the Embarcadero Boulevard back, just like it was before. And it, the real estate values went way up. There's about uh, 8,000 more people living in the Embarcadero Corridor now because of all the housing that was added, because people had the views of the bay. Um, but the most spectacular uh, of all is Seoul, South Korea. This freeway was built right through the middle of downtown Seoul on top of the river that runs through Seoul. It was built right after the Korean War. I guess it was sort of our gift to the Korean people. Um, and uh, carried uh, 160,000 vehicles a day, peak capacity. It was replaced uh, with, they didn't even try to replace the capacity. There's two moving lanes on each side of the river. Real estate, billions of dollars of real estate built. This was all done. Uh, this was started in 2001 when Young Bok Lee became mayor, or Lee and Young Bok, I got it backwards. Uh, 2001, it was all done by 2003. Um, and there he is. He's now president of South Korea. See how happy he is? Because he did the right thing. But he hated that road. He just hated that road. He just thought it was so ugly that it had covered the river. And so he became mayor and went in and changed it. And he didn't take no for an answer from the traffic engineers. In Milwaukee, without an earthquake, uh, we took this road out. This, this was on the north side of the downtown next to the Milwaukee River, so that the cars that parked next to the freeway uh, could look out over the river throughout the day. You'd park your car there, car with a view. You know, really worked well. But all the real estate was damaged along the road. So that's the plan. Not all those buildings have been built because the county government owns a lot of the land and they put all kinds of living wage requirements and damn liberals. Who just when uh, just when they were my friends on tearing the freeway down, then once it's torn down, then they make it impossible for a property owner to do anything. Um, so anyway, but a lot of it is done, and there's the population in Milwaukee in the downtown is doubled, now 15,000 people living in the downtown. Um, people like it. Nice place. Uh, now what I want you to see here is that 
engineers can change their minds. There's this myth that somehow engineers are like locked in. You know, since the Egyptian pyramids, they, they can't come up with a creative thought. Not true. I mean, I already told you that engineers did the two-rod street, so they, they were working with a good framework, a good design framework. They could do the right thing. Water, wetlands, the enemy, the Bureau of Reclamation, the Army Corps of Engineers, the Everglades, what they did to the Everglades. You know, those are all things, you know, those damn engineers ruining the Everglades. But you know what? The Army Corps of Engineers in 1999, they apologized for what they did to the Everglades. They know that there's a value to wetlands. That wetlands uh, are a setting for valuable plants and animals. It's a great setting for real estate. Developers have figured out you don't need to drain the wetlands. Develop around it. It's actually a great setting. The bats will eat the mosquitoes. It's not that bad. You can sell houses around the edges of these things. But anyway, the engineers, they now know. They know that the wetlands slow down flooding. They help you absorb congestion. See where I'm going with this? Water congestion. OK, so now they don't do this so much anymore. They don't do that. But the traffic engineers, they're still doing it. That's what the freeways and the big arterials are in the urban context. They're like channelizing the stream. They're killing off the light. They kill off the complex grid of the city, which is a setting. That's that little thing in the upper left-hand corner that uh, the DOTs and the FHWA don't want anything to do with. That's local streets. Well, we don't have anything to do with that. Just the big stuff. Well, the big stuff is not a setting for life. It's like channelizing the stream. Whereas the street grid, this is L'Enfant's plan for DC as amended by Burnham. Um, you know, the rich street grid is a great setting for development, for culture, for art, for music, for money. Um, you know, this is uh, Alexandria, same thing. So we're trying to deal with this. We're trying to do the same thing. The water engineers got it. They understood. They still do some bad stuff once in a while, but at least they know it's bad. It, you know, they're not idealistically draining wetlands. If they do it, they're cravenly doing it. It's better that they know it's bad. Well, the same thing needs to happen with traffic. Stop channelizing the traffic. Stop using a specialty to dominate the complexity of the city. So the CNU, in conjunction with ITE, the Institute of Transportation Engineering, um, we put out a manual for urban context streets uh, last March. And um, it's respected by engineers because it's ITE. And so we're trying to change this, to put back the urban forms, the street, the avenue, the boulevard, the connected street grid uh, as something that's part of the normal process of laying pavement. Now, Al Gore. Uh, you know, talks about the inconvenient truth. Um, and usually, the, he always talks about light bulbs and, uh, you know, green buildings. But um, ever since, uh, ever since the 2000 campaign, his advisor, Bob Shrum, told him not to talk about land use. And so he's like, you know, it's, jaws are sewed shut on that issue, which I think he should change. I mean, he's not running for anything. Why not say what you mean? You know, uh, in fact, if he had done that in 2000, he probably would have won. It, he would have been a lot more relaxed. But you know, what's happening is we have this green movement, which is fine. Put electric, put, put the energy efficient light bulbs everywhere, and it'll be a good thing. Do it. I have no problem with that. I'm for it. Our, my house has nothing but energy efficient light bulbs. Do green roofs, do green buildings, do all that stuff. But this is a lead green building gold award. The HSBC Bank headquarters of Chicago, which was in a close in suburb right next to a train stop, they move it to the energy efficient building way out three miles from the local, closest transit stop. So everybody has to go out and buy a car. And so the energy, whatever energy was saved by the building was totally wasted by the fact that everybody had to drive. And they got a gold award from the Green Building Council. 
And we complained about that. And the Natural Resource Defense Fund complained about that. And so now they've, they're, they're doing LEED ND, which we helped them design, which rewards uh, land use, not just uh, having green buildings. And here's, the, I'm almost done in case you're worried about the time. The, uh, this is, on the left, is Chicago, the Chicago metropolitan area. If you look on the edges, it's blue. That's way out in the low density areas. You know, nature. Very nice. That's the image of it. And then in the middle of the city, honk, honk, you know, you've got all the pollution and congestion. But if you look at the, the CO2 per capita production, the dirty stuff is on the outside because people are traveling such long distances by car, and the blue is in the middle of Chicago. And that's what's missing. Uh, oh, that's my book that he was talking about earlier, which you can still get online if you want. Um, here, just I'll just turn this off now. But the, the most, uh, thank you. So the, the, the important thing to understand is that uh, cities, just by their very existence, are good for the environment if they're organized properly so that the advantages of the city can come out. Manhattan Island in New York City, the average person uses 25% of the energy of the average American. And so the idea that, you know, when environmentalists that are dealing with water drainage with runoff issues and they say, um, you know, don't allow a building without having a drainage field that can absorb all the water from the building. Well, that, that would make it in New York illegal. So all of the advantages of having people living close together on transit and being able to walk would be wiped away. So we have now appealed to the EPA not to require these giant drainage fields. We'll never be able to build a city again. You know, I'm a Democrat. I'm a Democratic, I ran for office as a Democrat. I'm, uh, I'm for the EPA cleaning up the environment. But when they do things that are anti-urban that are also anti-environmental, it's a problem. And so our organization is raising hell about it. Urbanism is good for the environment. It's good for the economy. It's good for social relations. Kids can walk in urbanism. Kids can enjoy uh, a healthy lifestyle in urban place. Uh, urbanism is good. Architecture, planning, and landscape architecture should all support urbanism. Thank you very much. Oh, and uh, for those of you that for those of you that want to know more about CNU, you can go online at cnu.org. And also, we're having our annual meeting in Madison, Wisconsin, June one through four. I have a some uh, brochures here, which I'll put on this table if any of you want them. Uh, you can, uh, it'd be great to have you come. Thank you. Okay, any, any time for questions or are we done? Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you're the mayor of Toronto, you probably were, but um, could you describe the politics of eliminating a highway that went right through your downtown? Oh, well, you know, how was I ever able to get a highway eliminated? Uh, I did it uh, by first proposing the idea, and it was completely counterintuitive. And so the initial reaction was, you want to do what? I attracted an uh, editorial from the local newspaper saying I was an idiot for wanting to do it. You know, I went through it, but it took time, you know, and I just kept bringing up the idea. And I had help from Peter Park, who was a professor at UWM School of uh, Architecture and Planning. And he became the city planner. And we just kept at it. And the reason we won was visuals. Urbanism looks really good if it's done right. You kill them on visuals. The freeway looks terrible. People know it's ugly. They don't want to be near it. Uh, they had no visuals that they could show the people who wanted to keep the freeway. So eventually we won it. And, uh, we leveraged it. We had to negotiate with Tommy Thompson, who was no friend on that issue, but he wanted something else from us, so we we made a deal. That's what happened. Oh.
but it would have been easier to remove it. Some of the people, the affluent people on Lake Michigan thought that the freeway was the key to them traveling, that they couldn't get anywhere without a freeway. There is a sort of notion, you'll hear that from your governor here in, in uh, Indiana to some, some extent, where they'll talk about you know, opening up development in the southwestern corner of the state as if you couldn't go there without a big giant road. I mean, it's th th that kind of attitude uh, is pretty common. But once the road was gone, everybody, nobody would want to put it back now. Everybody, the one guy who was most against it died. That helped. So, <laughs> yeah, anything, any other questions anybody has? If you have, you know, if you have a dinner date or something, you can go, but I have more time if people do have, yeah. You're from St. Louis? Yeah, uh, St. Louis is really a good example. It kind of avoids the co almost completely negative image that Detroit has because uh, it's, not, it's not quite as devastated. And they, they did put in that light rail line, which was really smart. Um, but the freeway building in St. Louis and the urban renewal was just vicious. I mean, the population in Detroit was 900,000 in 1950, and now it's 330,000. You know, I mean, it just in, in the photograph, if you took photographs of all the empty spaces in St. Louis, it, it would look like war-torn Europe. Uh, you know, so it, it's very much the same situation as Detroit. Yeah, there were some very bad mayors in the late 50s and early 60s who really wanted to see the city torn apart. And I was there in, I'm, I was born in 1949. I was there in 1958 when there was still a streetcar running. And uh, the, some of the intersections, like in Forest Park, it was spectacular. It was a beautiful, beautiful city. And you know, eight years later, I went back and it was just wrecked. It's like uh, that song by the Pretenders, you know, my city was gone. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't quite. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, there's a lot of good thinking going on and there's uh, a lot of talk about capping the freeway in front of the arch. Just it's interesting that if you, next time any of you are in St. Louis, if you look at the arch, there was a neighborhood there that had more people in it than the French Quarter in New Orleans. There's one building left from the whole neighborhood. That's the Basilica. It's a small Catholic church. But that was a mostly Italian neighborhood. Uh, and it had iron, uh, iron railings and on the porches, very, not quite as quaint as the French Quarter, but uh, similar quality. If that had been saved, but the city went in and just ripped the place apart. They did it even before they even thought of putting the arch there. They just tore it up because it was guilty of being old. Uh, and so now they're trying to rebuild St. Louis. And there are a lot of people that are doing the right thing there. Yeah. You showed some cities uh, in Europe and other places, which are actually the, a product of a different planning process. Yeah. Um, planning process right here. Do you think we need to change sort of our way of planning, period, in the sense of being advisory capacity or, or the sort of democratic system of planning cities? What's your thoughts about, because really we are what we eat, right? Yeah, I'm not so sure that their method was different. Their actions are different. Um, I mean, like planning in Sweden is very in-depth, uh, you know, very invasive. And they made mistakes too. Um, but uh, in the U.S., the planning uh, has, like regional planning, has tended to, basically be a 
sublimated to the uh, planning that comes out of the highway department. And so it, they talk about planning. They have these similar topics in the books that they put together. They might even talk about poverty and social injustice and housing shortages and things like that. But they don't do anything about it. And, uh, you know, I, th I think that planning has gotten such a bad name in the U.S. that it's really important not to try to fix planning all at once, but to fix the ingredients. That's why I, you know, like street dimensions, uh, block density, intersection density, um, changing the purpose of a street back to the three purposes instead of the one, uh, coding so that uh, there can be mixed use in a commercial zone. Uh, these are all things that need to be embraced in the, at the local level. The planning thing is going to take more time. I mean, it is really the southwestern, I mean, the southeastern Michigan Regional Planning Commission doesn't like Detroit. I mean, they basically have been planning exactly what happened, the disappearance of Detroit. Uh, and the same thing with the southeastern Wisconsin Planning Regional Planning Commission, which uh, is very hostile to the city of Milwaukee. They have three members from each county, so uh, four small counties with uh, less population than the city of Milwaukee dominate the, the proceedings. And so, you know, when, when we had, when I was chairman of the finance committee in the state house, I tried to eliminate all the planning money from the state of Wisconsin to the Southeastern Regional Planning Commission. And I was attacked by uh, APA, some magazine and everything, for being some sort of right wing, you know, guy who didn't believe in planning. It wasn't that I believed in planning. They didn't like Milwaukee. They were hurting Milwaukee. Their planning was bad planning. I mean, whoever designed Auschwitz, that was bad planning. You know, it's planning. Just because it's planning doesn't mean it's good. Uh, engineering can be good. It can be bad. It could be the Taj Mahal. It could be a concentration camp. So, uh, you know, with planning, I think there's been sort of an assumption that there's an utopian, idealistic attitude that goes with being a planner and a neglect, particularly in the U.S., of the details. What are the, what are the metrics? And that's where it really, and there's also this sort of thing about not sharing it with the public. You know, the planning process for the DOTs, it tends to be to put the public into little rooms where they have a recorder who takes down their irrelevant comments, at least to the DOTs. They never get to meet together in a big room where they could, you know, take out a noose and hang the DOT secretary on the spot. You know, so the whole thing is set up very defensively to keep the public away. And there's a mystery to road building, which doesn't need to be a mystery. I mean, when people in, I mentioned Mequon earlier, the, the DOT wanted to widen the road in Mequon, and their own legislator was a big highway lobby kind of guy. He got a lot of money from the road builders, so they wouldn't listen to him. So when I was mayor, I helped them. I had my city engineer go out and help the anti-road widening people in Mequon. Uh, and they learned all the lingo. And they'd go to the meeting and talk about, um, you know, trips per hour, leisure time value. They, you know, they caught, they caught them in all their tricks. And uh, in the end, I think DOT bureaucrats would actually enjoy life more if they just shared stuff, stopped being so paranoid and, and actually share. Uh, and you'd end up with better results. Okay, well, if, oh, wait, sorry. Um, a lot of things at the urban level seem to be bogged down with a lot of stasis. And, I mean, I, I just wonder if, if, if the answer is more policy or what? I... I I actually, uh, you know, my own personal view, this wouldn't be the view of CNU, my own personal view is that if the United States government got out of, for example, the transportation business entirely. In Canada, there's no national highway program. There's no national transit program. And there isn't much in the way of housing at the national level. That's all done at the local or provincial level. Uh, so uh, I really think local governments uh, could, if they had 
if they had the right tools, you know, like form-based coding and and if they were allowed to build normal sized streets and not focus everything on congestion mitigation, I think the local governments could actually be trusted to do, I mean, look at the old parts of Muncie. There was nothing sophisticated about it, but the, the old street grid functions really well. So, you know, let that happen again. I, I really don't think the states and the federal government really need to do a lot. I, I mean, the federal government, they should uh, get out of Afghanistan and get out of Iraq and I can't think of a lot of other things I want them to do right now. Yeah. How's that? No, I, we're codes are really important. You know, you need a you need a good code. When I showed you Port Washington, you know, it's 29 miles north of Milwaukee with the Terminator Vista. Uh, uh, an architect probably, or a planner didn't do that, but they had a pattern book from the Austrian Empire. It's actually Krakow's Main Street uh, has a church just like that terminating the Vista, and that's where the pattern book came from. Uh, so you need a plan. You need guiding. You can't just do things randomly. Well, you could, but... Uh, but the plan is forcing the chaos of sprawl right now. I mean, that's not, the, I, I really want to make that clear. This is, the, uh, the suburban America doesn't happen just by itself. It happens because a lot of money is spent on designs that are uh, not urban. And because of separating the zoning, there's a lot of interventions that create sprawl. And it, it, no, that doesn't mean it should just be do whatever you want to do. I mean, Houston claims to be a city without a zoning code, but if you look carefully, you find out they have almost all of the ingredients of a zoning code, including off-street parking regulations. So, uh, you know, it's the libertarian ideas are ideas that, uh, you know, we're willing to talk with libertarians, and, uh, you know, they always want to say that... Uh, some of them, like Randall O'Toole, who really isn't a libertarian, but he, he wants to always say that we want to interfere and organize people's life. And I say to him, I, I challenged him in our debate. I said, I, how about this? Let's make a deal. No national highway program. No national transit program. Nothing. No HUD. No housing program. None of it. I'll accept that. How about you? And he had to think about it really hard, and he ultimately refused to answer because he has to have the heroin of the, uh, n the interstate highway program. He has to have it. Because the, the locals would never build it themselves. Indianapolis would never have built all those huge roads by themselves. Never. Milwaukee built one freeway by itself in 1949 with their own money, and they never would do it again. It, it was stupid. They tore down their own tax base and, and made it easier to leave town. I mean, what... What were they trying to do? And they never did it again. But the Interstate Act paid for it. So, uh, but, you know, in terms of interventions, yes, you need a good code, you need rules. Uh, you know, what uh, Baron Haussmann did in Paris, setting up the, the mid-19th century version of Paris, it's beautiful, it's magnificent. Thank God he didn't do it to all of Paris, or you wouldn't have Montmartre, but, uh, you know, it's, those are rules. There's a rule there that approximately 16 feet from the sidewalk is retail. And above that is housing or offices. And so he has this line. And if you look at those parts of Paris, there it is. And it might have been a blacksmith shop in 1890. And today it's a hair salon. But it really works well. So there are rules. It's just different rules than the suburban sprawl rules. You're ready to kick me out, is it? Oh, okay. Yeah. The, uh, the government, the powers that be, like to hold on to as much power and gain as much power as they can from everyone. Um, and it seems like if we're, you know, you have to 
change that uh, minimum parking on the street, it has to release some power from these people. They can't control the parking on the street anymore. And uh, that seems yeah, that, another example of that would be health regulations all over the country prohibiting sidewalk cafes. And we had that in Milwaukee. When I came in, the health department was really worried that somebody might trip over a chair or there wouldn't be quite enough room for people to walk by if there was a sidewalk cafe. So they had made it hell. There were a few of them that had gotten variances, but almost no sidewalk cafes. And we had to change that. Now, there is a reason to leave enough room so a wheelchair can get by. And you, you do need to make sure that, and they do that in New York. Any of you that have ever been to Little Italy in New York, the very crowded sidewalk, all the, a lot of the restaurants have outside dining. But they're very careful because the inspector comes by to leave enough room so that a, a, per, a person with a wheelchair can get through. But, you know, to prohibit it, to prohibit outdoor dining. And for some of the old timers at the health department, that was really tough to let go of that because it made them feel really important. Uh, another example of that is our health nurses uh, had gotten used to giving immunizations. When Medicaid came along, all of a sudden, uh, poor people had pretty good health insurance. Medicaid's not bad. And the, it was the obligation of the Medicaid uh, provider to give the immunizations. Well, the city of Milwaukee nurses and the health commissioner felt threatened by that because they had to find something else to do. And so they went to the health care companies and they got them all to sign contracts, the insurance, Blue Cross, et cetera, prohibiting Milwaukee children who were covered by Medicaid to go to their own provider but had to go to the city. They forced them to go to the city so that they could keep that work and have control. And as a result, the immunization rate dropped from about 80% down to 37%. And we had a measles epidemic, and a couple of kids died. You know, that's bad municipal service. You deliver it very slowly. People go to their own doctor, and they're told by law they have to go to the city. So they go to, you take your screaming, screaming kids somewhere else. And so it's delivered very slowly at double the cost, and, and then it kills people. You know, that's bad municipal service. And, but that attitude, you know, there, there are people that feel so frightened that their job is going to change or be eliminated that, uh, you know, you have to work with that. Sometimes that's a legitimate concern. But that happens with these zoning regulations. You know, you're a zoning attorney. You walk in the store. I mean, you're, I mean, not a zoning attorney. You're an inspector. You walk into a store. Look around a little bit. Everybody's quivering. Now, you have a legitimate role there if they're putting dirty water in the soup or, you know, hurting people, whatever, that's a bad thing. But that attitude that I've got power and I can use it, that, that doesn't work in planning. I mean, you really need to try to do what adds value. Okay. This conversation is going to continue downtown at Vera Mays uh, at 6 o'clock. Uh, you are all welcome to join us. Uh, you'll be paying for your own dinner, by the way. <laughs>